Hollywood used to do movies that had faith, had hope, had love, had redemption, had laughter in it. They don't even do that anymore. It's all this woke craziness that, you know, more divisiveness, more sex, more anger. Um, I want to do movies that Hollywood used to do, and we've been pretty good at putting them out there. The hardest, most difficult part is letting people know about it. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. This show is available wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like it, please take a moment to review it on your favorite platform. That helps spread the word about these interviews with these great guests. This is the show where I interview major thought leaders from many fields of influence to show how our worldview, based on the truth, changes everything. My guests today are Kevin and Sam Sorbo. The Sorbos are actors, producers, directors, authors, and more. Kevin recently published a book about masculinity for children entitled The Test of Lionhood. And he and Sam recently also produced a film called Miracle in East Texas, which tells the story of God's providence in the lives of two con men. Very funny film. Sam also hosts the weekday syndicated radio and television program, The Sam Sorbo Show. They're doing great work for the kingdom. They're storytellers. And that's how this relates to us. What is the story that God is telling through your life? Please welcome Kevin and Sam to the show. Kevin and Sam Sorbo, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. Thanks so much. We just, we're so happy to be here with you. Finally. <laughs> I know we've been working to get the schedule for a long time. Everybody's got a lot of things going on and it's all good. So we get to talk about some of that on the show today. But first, I just want to mention to our audience that you are Summit parents, that your kids are graduates of the Summit Ministries program. That's correct. In fact, our daughter's, going, our daughter's going back for a second second round. And the funny thing yeah. is she was the one that we were most, uh, uh, well, sort of concerned about. She's an extreme introvert, and we wanted to make sure that she, you know, wasn't so far out of her element that she, um, that it was hard, that it was too hard for her. She loved it so yeah. much. Yeah. She's like, I'm going back for the full year. <laughs> <laughs> I love wow. it. Well, it was great. It was great to meet her. It's been fun to meet your kids and they've all just done, they've been fantastic at Summit, really been leaders in the group and um, kind of helped create that environment that makes Summit so special. But how, what's that meant for your family? I'm just, I know there are people who are watching and listening, thinking, are we going to pull the trigger on this this summer or not? Well, I'll just throw my two cents. There, there was a um... I grew up in Minnesota, but there was there was a camp in Wisconsin that uh, I went to four straight summers when I was like in sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And I'll tell you, it was similar to what Summit is doing at that time. And it was, uh, I you know, I, I I'm not an, an introvert, but it, I was like, eh, I, just, I, I I'm like Nixon. I just don't know if I like people very much. You know, <laughs> so it's, I didn't want to deal with it, but it ended up being such a great summer, and I look forward to it every year after that. I mean, just the camaraderie, the Bible teachings, the 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 the, the, the competitions we had. I mean, the play acting. We always did, we always put on our own little plays and stuff. Of course, I was an actor that had been one since I was 11 years old. So um, it was just a lot of fun. I look forward to it, and we got to meet people from all these other you know, surrounding areas yeah. uh, of the Twin Cities that I never would have met other, other than through sports or something, but it was pretty neat. Well, I'll tell you, for our family in particular, um, the boys came back so much stronger in their faith. I think mm. uh, one thing that I've learned through homeschooling and just parenting in general is that children have a thirst, a desire, a craving for truth. And yeah. so when you give them the truth, they love it, they want more of it, they dive deeper. I started, well, we started with apologetics with our kids when our oldest was um, entering high school and right. uh, yeah. entering, so homeschool, high school, right? right? So high school age, we started with apologetics and they ate it up. And so some, it was, was the thing that allowed them to really sort of bring that faith in a sense out into the world, right? Because at home as home their group of friends is their group of friends, but going with strangers and having these conversations, these deep conversations and cementing and, and forming their faith on a, on a more profound, on a deeper level was, um, I would say, instrumental in them becoming the young men and the women that they are today. You should tell them about the, the apologetics and the interest for them came from a very interesting man. And you should tell him a quick story about the oh. guy that taught that because it was cool for them to meet this guy. Yeah. He was he used to be in a gang, right? Yeah. Do you know Joe's story? 
Yeah. He's a he's a spoken word artist. Yeah. And um, so he was the guy. He had who, a class. For our speech. It was our speech and debate club that yeah. was focused on us, on, on the participants knowing apologetics. The idea behind speech and debate for them, and we joined them, was giving children the ability to um, to to testify, to advocate for their faith in a line at Starbucks, right. wow. at shopping in the mall, whatever, like just giving them this facility of being able to profess their faith and to mm. and to um, support it with arguments. Right. Um, just on an everyday average. And so Joe, who's like. As wide as he is tall. Ripped up, tats everywhere. Tats. You know? <laughs> and his story is remarkable. He, yeah. He'd been in a gang and he was arrested and met Jesus in the backseat of a police car, to, to put it very bluntly. Uh, when he got out of the car, the officer who was arresting him said, what happened to you? You're, you're different. And he looked at him and just said, Jesus. And wow. that was his... Is coming to faith. And, you know, I got to throw in, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. I did an, um, a documentary with John Lennox, who's probably one of the most famous apologetic people out there with the work that he's done. You know, he's from, he's a math professor from Oxford University. He holds like six degrees, speaks five languages. And um, we shot three weeks in Oxford and two weeks in Israel on a documentary with him. And it's called um, Against the Tide, Proving God in a World of Science. And I hope people will please go check it out. They can go to SorboStudios.com, get an autograph copy that way as well. But, John, it really is apologetics for dummies like me, is what I tell people. It's a fantastic yeah. look at what this guy, he's debated the greatest atheist in the world. You know, um, Dawkins, Singer, Hitchens. Dawkins, Singer, yeah, Dawkins, Hitchens, all these guys. And he kills them with truth and kindness and love and humor. And he yeah. sounds like Winnie the Pooh when he yeah. talks. <laughs> but great guy and i highly recommend it's called against the tide i highly recommend it for people i think people love it and you talk about the transformation of of the people guy that was working with our kids um we did a movie that samuel called let there be light which is a fantastic movie i was very fortunate to direct it as well and we both starred in the kids in it but michael franzisi's story is the same way mm. if you look at his life you know he came to faith in in uh in prison Prison. After his father put a hit on him in their own prison, they put him in solitary confinement. Which is interesting and, because uh, that is actually part of the story of your new movie. Yes. yes. Firing Squad. Firing Squad. Wow. Yep. Well, I think of you guys as America's storytellers. You 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 do documentaries, you. you you produce films, you write films, you've starred in films, television, and and so forth. And, and I really thought it'd be fun if we could kind of dig into that a little bit because sure. the, the the way this conversation is going is is perfect. But most people are never going to be invited to give a lecture. You know, please stand up for 45 minutes and tell us the top 10 reasons you believe in God. But you are in conversations in line at the grocery stores you mentioned, at Starbucks, with people at work and things like that. And it's your story that really gets to people's hearts. And as we mm. even as we've been diving in, we've only been doing we've only been on, you know, on the show for five minutes and think of all the stories that have already been told already. Talk about mm. talk about what draws you. I know you're actors, but talk about what draws you to story as a way of of communicating passionately about what's important in life. Uh, for me, it's the first 20 pages of a script. I get a lot of scripts come into me. I thought 20 pages don't hold anything for me. I just move on to the next one. But um, I love true stories, just like Sam does. We love we love stories that people can relate to because they are true. Hollywood doesn't want to do these things anymore. They just want to spend you know 200 million dollars on special effects on a three million three hundred million dollar movie and throw 100 million dollars and promote it. And they do not. You know, we do movies Hollywood used to do. Hollywood used to do movies that had faith, had the hope, had love, had redemption, had laughter in it. They don't even do that anymore. It's all this woke craziness that, you know, more divisiveness, more sex, more anger. Um, I want to do movies that Hollywood used to do, and we've been pretty good at putting them out there. The hardest, most difficult part is letting people know about it because we don't have a $100 million advertising budget for a $3 million budget movie. So, yeah. you know, God's not dead. I tell people that's an anomaly. I mean, $2 million movie making $140 million worldwide is... That's unbelievable, but that's all word of mouth. But I've yeah, done but even that they put a lot of money they, behind it. They put money behind it, but still wasn't that as big as these other movies. They can't compete against Hollywood. But um, you know, my biggest problem is how do we get the stories out there? Because I've done some wonderful movies, and part of that didn't get, get the light of day that it deserved. I look at the last last year. 
I, we had yeah. Left Behind, Rise of the Antichrist, and Miracle in East Texas. Wonderful, wonderful movies. And people come up to me and say, oh, I saw that movie. It was awesome. And people come to me, what if? I shot What If 14 years ago. And they go, when did that just come out recently? I go, no, 14 years ago. <laughs> you know? But it's in my book, in my 80-plus movies, it's in my top three. It was directed by Dallas Jenkins, who's doing that little thing called The Chosen right now. It was funded by Jerry Jenkins, his father. And um, it's it's the same writers that did God's Not Who Dead. Who wrote Left Behind. Yeah, who wrote Left Behind. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, it, that's the battle is, is how do you get these small movies out there to people? I think, uh, you know, we communicate in stories. Uh, right. Stories are the communication mechanism. That's why Jesus was a storyteller. That's why we yeah. have the parables is because they're timeless. They, they withstand the test of time. They're, um, they, they transcend time. And so even though we might be telling stories that aren't maybe as transcendent as Jesus told, <laughs> Um, we're still trying to tell stories that uplift and inspire because we believe that uh, that the human spirit is one that overcomes. Um, and we have to believe that that's part of our faith, right, is that we can be forgiven because there is redemption, right? And if we didn't believe that, we would be telling other stories, like yeah. perhaps some of the stories that are coming out of Hollywood. And to that end, you know, it's a very important thing. I I started saying... Dr. Jeff, I've started saying to people, parenting isn't hard, teaching isn't hard, and learning is enjoyable because we have told in our culture these lies. Mm. Parenting is hard, teaching is hard, learning is hard. Those are lies. But the problem is that if you tell yourself a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. Sure. And so parents think this is so hard. When if they would think it's easy, it would be so much easier. But if they think that it's hard, by golly, it's going to be hard. And so we have to be careful what stories we tell ourselves. That's I'll go back to Summit for, for a minute, because the story that Summit tells these young people is how important truth is and what the truth is and where to find it and how to find it. And so the stories that the young people start to tell themselves when they leave Summit are stories that are uplifting, that are edifying, that are encouraging to themselves and to others. And it makes all the difference in their lives. So Kevin and I just did a documentary that just came out called Hollywood Takeover. And the documentary deals with this, this idea that um, the CCP, the Communist Chinese Party, or mm -hmm. Chinese Communist Party, has basically infiltrated Hollywood because yep. it represents such a large market. It is not a free market. It is not a capitalist market, but it's a market nonetheless. And so the Politburo in China said, if you want to bring your movies over here and get money from our market, from our enormous market, yep. you will change your movies to satisfy our desires. And their desire is the degradation of the United States yep. and the elevation of China and of communism. And so these are now the stories that we are telling ourselves via Hollywood, that Hollywood is telling to us and to the world, because let's face it, our stories are probably our biggest export in the world. And, it's, and, and so this goes back to how important it is, the stories that we choose to tell. We can choose any story we want. We can choose to tell ourselves that parenting is hard, but we can also choose the opposite. And it's the same thing in Hollywood. And the, the film actually, Kevin and I feature very small in the movie. The movie actually deals with a guy who was uh, basically instrumental in getting the big blockbuster Hugely movies. instrumental, from the Iron Man movies to Avengers to whatever. He was the yeah. guy yep. who brought the movies to China, and he had a change of heart because at one point, it's interesting, he got off the phone and his wife said, are you really comfortable with what you're negotiating right now? Because he's negotiating to put into a movie how bad the United States is and how great China is. Yep. And he's wow. saying, well, if we change this line, but we, we add this line about, you know, pro-China, anti-U.S., how's that? And he gets off the phone and his wife goes, uh, are you really comfortable with that? All this time he had been telling himself, we are exporting capitalism. We're bringing free markets to China. And, you know, he even yeah. shows... And that was a lie. And they even show uh, what Robert Downey Jr. is over there promoting Iron Man 3, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever. Yeah. 
and they would feed him the things to say. And on camera, you got him saying to Chinese people, he says, I actually feel like I'm Chinese. I, yeah, love, I love everything China. about you. I love, but, and you're looking at a country that rules their people with the iron hand of communism. But let's face it, the government of China is very capitalistic. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. they, I mean, they own America. They, they bought 450,000 acres of farmland. Yeah. And they're, the food and everything they're growing there, they're shipping it back to China. It's nothing to benefit America. And uh, she's got a great line in there. When, the, when a woman interviewing her, the director behind her, all the producer, says, what's the main reason? She goes, it's money. And mm -hmm. it is. It's all just oh, about that, money. It's about money, which is power. Yeah. But yeah. really, we're fighting for the soul of America. Because yeah. if we continue to tell America, and by the way, this is a story that's being told in our classrooms now because the communists have infiltrated the teachers' unions, and so they control the messaging in our classes. Right? Walt Disney said back in the 1950s, Walt Disney said movies and television will influence our youth. He's, you know, Disney's flipping his grave right now. They've done that was the name, understatement of the century. Done those brand. <laughs> and, but but it's, it's interesting you said that, because I saw a poll of 30 years old and younger. They believe communism is a good thing now. They actually think that well, we're, they're being we're, taught that yeah, in school. They're, that's what, what it's and also, they're being taught to but also AI. been taught through television. They're movies. being taught that yeah. um, the whole culture stuff. seems to be giving that yeah. message. Yeah. Well, right. uh, I, you know, this was I, I appreciate you're talking about Hollywood takeover uh, because I, one of the questions I really wanted to ask you is we're recording this very shortly after the Oscars for yep. 2024. The and, what now? <laughs> Nobody watches that anymore, but I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I think I've heard of them. <laughs> well, well you, you, you look at it enough, and you know what films were featured, to be able to answer this question. What sure. do today's Oscars tell us about the stories that we are telling ourselves as Americans? Interesting. Well, Barbie, of course, uh, kind of was the yeah. You don't you don't need star. men. Don't need men. Men are not important. And that story is you don't need men. Yeah. And of course, that is the story in our culture. I do uh, I do a TV show. It's called the Sam Sorbo Show uh, <laughs> on, on Patriot TV. And yesterday, I had my son, uh, my 22 year old Braden, who was your your first Sorbo Summit graduate. Um, talking about the dilemma that young men face today. So God's plan for young men is for them to grow up, mature, get some kind of way of supporting themselves in a family, find a woman, live up to her expectations, uh, raise a family, be become a father, raise a family, and, and all of that. But what's happened with the feminist movement is we've told the story to women that they don't need men, mm -hmm. that they want yeah. sex, that they should have sex at any at any cost, basically free sex, um, that they can single parent children all by themselves. And so what's happened is women no longer hold the hold the line for men to live up to. And so young men don't have to live up to anything that removes their in a sense, it removes their purpose. And this is my son, my 22 year old son telling me this. So, you know, he comes home and he says, there's, there are gals at the, he goes dancing, he goes to a country bar, and there, there are gals there who basically will throw themselves at him. Mm. And they'll say, we can go out in the parking lot right now. And wow. he knows what they're saying. Yeah. And it's all his willpower to say, no, thank you, because he understands that that is poison. It's poison to a young man. Pornography is poison to a young man. But if we don't tell our young men the truth, then, then they are steeped in this lie that sex can be free, that pornography is easy, and basically they will have lives that become valueless in their own eyes. Mm. They're destroying their own uh, their own lives. Kevin, you so wrote a. Oh, uh, you know, sorry. Go ahead, uh, Kevin. You wrote a children's book uh, mm. about masculinity, and yeah. talk, talk about that for a minute because. I thought that was a that was an interesting move, and a lot of people have probably seen the Facebook uh, advertisements for it. Brave Books has a huge presence right now, but you specifically dug into that so little kids can start learning about biblical masculinity. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love what Brave Books is doing. Um, they reached out to me because they see that I have, I have a very strong voice out there and not afraid to tell the truth. And uh, my son actually goes to the gym wearing a shirt that says Embrace Masculinity on it. And I love that. Also, the and, future is patriarchy. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they approached me when, uh, um, you know, our buddy Kirk was part of that thing as well, yeah. Kirk Cameron, where he, he got attacked last year for reading his children's book in front of children at a public library. He wasn't allowed. And our public libraries that we pay our tax dollars to, to keep them open wouldn't let them come in. But they were okay with drag queens reading to the seven-year-olds. I mean, it's, the world has gone absolutely so insane. Because Kirk's saying, very scary. What you're saying is it's not just the story, but it's who's telling the story yeah. that matters. Right. So I, I went out there and wrote a book. It's called The Test of Lionhood. I hope people check it out. And it's really about, you know, uh, letting kids grow up to be kids. Let them grow up to be strong. The boys well, grow up to be strong men, strong right. representatives, of not only in their, their, to their children and their wife, but also to their community, to the town they live in, instead of this, this craziness well, we got going on right now. So the story is about a young lion cub who has to step up to the plate. He has to conquer yeah. his fear. He has to overcome, um, be courageous in order to save the life of his, the of his sister. baby sister. Yeah. And he does. And he does with the help of some fantasy um, but he but he comes through and he becomes stronger because of it. And so that's an uplifting story, the kind of story that we want young men to hear about so that they can have a vision. We need to give children the vision of where they're going as opposed to just meeting them where they are and serving yeah. them where they are. We want them to we want them to strive. We want them to try to achieve, to to reach higher. And that's what this book does. Well, and the, al the alphabet crowd went after me, of course, saying I'm anti. I said, I'm not anti anything. I'm pro child. Yes. You know, there's yeah. not let let, you know, Bruce Jenner waited till he's 60 to change his 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 sex. Her so sex. His, her, yeah, her, her sex. Um, if, we're, if you're 18 years old and you can go into war and die for our country, let them at least get to be 18 years old to make a, a sort of a more adult decision. Don't tell a five year old because he puts on mom's high heels that it's time to cut his penis off. and He wants to be a girl. He's five. Let kids grow up. How many of these transgenders now are coming out of the woodwork that are 18 to 30 saying, what did you do to me, mom? Yes. I was just a kid at the time. Yes. What were you thinking? They're coming out. The stories are left and right. I'm not making that stuff up. I can pull those things up anywhere. Chloe Cole is suing, so, yeah. suing Kaiser Permanente for it's, funding her surgery. It's insane what we're doing to these kids. There's a great video of this guy. He sits at a table. It's just him and the kid. Obviously, the camera guys. One kid at a time. Six, seven years old. $5,000 here and three early cookies. You can only have one. They, everyone took the cookie. And the little brains, they don't look at 5,000. Well, I can buy a lot of Oreo cookies with that. They don't think that way. Yeah. So it's like, okay. but, they're, but they're okay to ch change their sex. They're smart enough and mature enough. I mean, what we're doing now is absolutely insane. And we're, we're feeding it through the tubes. You can talk to any doctor out there behind, behind closed doors so he doesn't have to say it out loud to get in trouble. They say, you know what? Yeah. We had one, one every six months came in. We're getting 10 a week now. Because yeah. we're showing, the way, the, we're training these kids, and it's nuts. And it's through storytelling. It's through storytelling. So we tell them a story, and it's a fantasy story. You'll feel better yeah. if you go on testosterone and take your breasts off and have surgery, and you're going to do well, better. And that's a, it's a lie. Mm -hmm. But that's why we, that's why with, especially with children, obviously, we have to train our children to galvanize, to, to protect their eyes, protect their ears. Because there are certain things you can't unsee or unhear. Right. And you have to be careful what stories you're allowing in. That's why, you know, I encourage, I encourage parents and just people in general, be very choosy in what you decide to watch as entertainment. Be very choosy, especially as entertainment. And you know what else? Be very picky mm -hmm. about the music. Because music has words. I don't understand how this works, but some people don't hear the lyrics. I only hear the lyrics of songs. Some people don't hear the lyrics, but what happens is the music, the music yeah. gets into your head and the lyrics are part of it. Yeah. And so you are repeating the mantra of those lyrics. Every time you repeat the song, you like the song, it's catchy. But if the lyrics are USA bad, you know, you're not the right gender, whatever those lyrics Bruce are. Bruce Springsteen, born in the USA. Listen to the words. Right. Was that, was John, that, John was Lennon's that positive words. Imagine there's yeah. no, imagine there's no people like Im imagine, the, you know, but guess who American woman, American woman is the Statue of Liberty. Mm. Get away from me. People don't listen to the words. They don't pay attention to what the lyrics are saying. It was a Canadian group bashing America. 
And so people need to wake up. Look, this is why parables, Jesus, the, the Bible is so relevant today because history does repeat itself over and over again. Yeah. So Jesus' stories, they, mm-hmm. they apply to every generation that's out there. It's true. Absolutely. That's that's a gr- that's such a great insight. Well, I'm thinking uh, I'm thinking now about h- how we rewrite those stories. You, you know, of course, at Summit we we talk to the students about God's story from Genesis to Revelation, His grand narrative, and that this isn't really the story of, of your life. You're not asking what's my story. You're asking what story am I in. That's the first mm-hmm. question that you've got to ask. But then sure. t- talk a little bit about that because. It, this is this is really important. It's like we we end up unless we're intentional about telling our story, God's way. Yes. That we yes. end up just sort of running scripts that were programmed for us by the culture, or maybe by our parents' shortcomings, or whatever yes. else it happens mm-hmm. to be. Um, I bet we could get some insight from you on how you set about developing a story and how we can rewrite those stories uh, for ourselves. Well, go ahead. I will say um, one of the stories that we have that's sort of prevalent in the culture is I brought my kid to church once a week, you know, for, for his whole life. He's now a Christian. But just because you inherit something doesn't mean you actually absorb it and embrace it. And so... We have young professing Christians graduating high school, but the moment they're out of the home and they're in college and they're not forced to go to church or whatever, they lose their faith because when their faith is challenged, it really was never there to be to begin with. So we have to stop telling ourselves this sort of fallacy that as long as you take your kid to church every week and they go to church, you know, kids camp or whatever, that they will be Christian. You need to have the in-depth conversations with your children Mm -hmm. about meaning, life, what God's plan is for their life, what story they are in, and who's, who's writing that story, right? Because as you said, the culture can write the story, or we can allow God to write the story, and we ought to be trying to find out what story God's writing for our life as opposed to the culture. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's my input on that question, I think. That's pretty good input. Okay. <laughs> Kevin, you mentioned that you read a lot of scripts and that within the first 20 pages, you know whether yeah. it's a good one or not. What happens in those first 20 pages if it really grabs your attention? You know, it's, it's hard to say. I just want to back up a second for the documentary. I forgot to mention epictv.com, I think it is. Oh, Hollywood Takeover. Hollywood Takeover. Hollywood. Epic yeah. TV. Okay. Epic. Yeah. They will go to Epic as well. Um, you know, it, it, it's funny because my, it depended on my mood that day. Maybe as a script I, I threw away and wasn't interested. And if I read it a month earlier, a month later, I said, wait a minute, this is an interesting story. So um, it, it just, it's, it's hard to say. Maybe it's, to me, it's all about the characters. I call them actors' movies that I'm doing. I call them the ones Hollywood used to do, where the story is driven by actors. It's not visual effects. It's characters you can relate to. You know, I grew up watching all the old black and white movies because of my mom. I loved watching Spencer Tracy, Catherine Epp, and Jimmy Stewart, Cary Grant, all those guys. I mean, still watch them all the time. My daughter loves them, too, which is great for us because we <laughs> share them with her. But um, it really just comes down to, okay, these are maybe there's one character that I can relate to, whatever it may be. Maybe I see a lot of myself in that character. Maybe I got a buddy or you know a business person I knew at one. I don't know what it may be, but I, it might propel me to keep reading that script and trying to find out more about the story. I probably read a thousand scripts, and I probably got it down to thirty that I want to get done. And we've done a couple of them. Um, but the, the biggest thing, once again, is try and raise money for them. I mean, if you do a three million dollar movie and you tell you know the layman that they go, wow, three million bucks. That's catering budget in Pirates of the Caribbean. Right. I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. That's nothing compared to the budget those movies have. And so for investors out there, I talk, tell them all the time, a $3 million movie, you have a much better chance of getting your money back because most movies fail. Most movies won't make it. That's why Hollywood will do a slate of movies. They'll have 10 movies. If they have two super ones that did great, that can offset the losses Covers from the other losses, ones. losses, yeah. Disney yeah. was not fortunate last year. They lost over a billion dollars. Wow. So. Wow. Some bad people decisions. people got very tired of what they were throwing out yeah, there. Yeah, that's America fascinating. It's, it's 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 hard to imagine that you could lose a billion dollars telling stories if people really want them. They enjoy yeah. watching movies. They enjoy stepping into somebody else's life for a moment and seeing how it relates to their own. 
Yeah. But you know, Dr. Jeff, I mean, we we've been lulled into a sense of complacency that we finally, Mm -hmm. I think, over the past three years have, have woken up from. And so, you know, for a long time. Hollywood was telling stories that were like, well, I don't know if that's really true, um, but it's funny, so I'll go along with it, and and that's fine. Now people are saying, no, you've gone too far. Hollywood has gone yep. too far in yep. many cases. Not in all cases, in many cases. Um, Disney went too far, yep. and people said, mm, I'm divesting. I'm I'm just not going to support this anymore because well, it has, it's now affecting the culture in such... Um, such measurable ways. Well, it's, it's like the Bud Light debacle, okay? Know your audience. Mm. It's as right. simple as that. Disney knows their audience. And all of a sudden you're going, well, we want to appeal to the one, less than 1% of the population. Why? Right. I mean, it's, it's really weird. What well, we're it's doing the out people there. in charge. They're, well, I know they're it's appealing the people to in themselves. Charge. And, you know, as storytellers, you tell stories that appeal to you. Unfortunately, some of the people in charge have different tastes and beliefs. And you better believe that if you're that that you have a religion, it may be Christian, it could be a different religion, yeah. and included in those religions is atheism. Mm-hmm. And so if that's your religion, then you're going to tell stories that uplift that belief system, that worldview. And unfortunately, <laughs> we have a clash of worldviews worldviews mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. In, and it's and it's um, demonstrably it's demonstrable politically. Right. So the political worldview, the worldview of atheism politically is communism. Perfect example of in the movie world. Look at the movie Noah that came out the same year. My movie God's Not Dead came out in 2014. <laughs> they hired an atheist director for that movie. Now look at the massive, the massive Jewish population in Hollywood that really started. The Jewish population really started. The Warner Brothers were Jewish yeah. and every manager and agent and publicist that were all Jewish. Why would you? The Old Testament is your Bible. Why would you hire an atheist that didn't believe in it and redid Noah the way he looked at it? So what happened is all it the people really of faith Noah. rushed to the movies. <laughs> what, what Sam? Go ahead. What do you call it? I called it uh, Waters World meets uh, Transformers. Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> so so we're we're at that we're at that premiere. We get invited before it even came out in theaters at the Paramount lot, and Sam and I are sitting back like thirty rows, and. The only producer, probably of faith, came out and said, "Oh, he called himself the yeah. the, what, the nominal Christian whatever. producer." He, he, he just said, "What he said, you got to understand, this was the director's vision of this movie." And at the end of it, the movie, a guy raised a hand like third row, didn't know we were there. He said, "You know, God's Not Dead is really doing well. Why wouldn't Hollywood do more of that?" He goes, "Well, we'll leave the independent movies to independent uh, producers. We're going to wow. do the big black. Wow. That's just what we do." So I told her, I said, you watch what happens. People of faith are going to flock to this because look, the trailer looks great. You know, they, no. and, then, and then they're watching and going, wow, Noah was a schizophrenic alcoholic hell-bent on destroying his family after this journey. Okay. <laughs> so I said, they're going to drop like 65% next weekend. It dropped 67% of the, yeah. the, the box office take. Yeah. Use the big blockbuster movies will go up for the next for two months before it starts tapering off. But, so. but here's the thing: what do you expect? Yeah, you're, they you're lost over a hundred, hundred ninety million dollars in that movie. You're getting a story about something that the person who's telling you the story believes didn't happen. Right. Exactly. Right. right. And and you're somebody who believes it absolutely happened. That it's not. It's untenable. Yeah. Yeah. They never should have done that. But because they don't believe it happened, they think that it's okay. And you don't have to do it with faith in your face. I get it. We no, talked about this before, that, but they took it completely there's a, out. There's a, there's a disdain that the atheist community, that the committed atheist community has for the committed believer community. There's a disdain. Well, and that's through movies and television, once again, because every movie with a Christian, every movie with a, uh, a, a pastor, they're always the bad guys. They're always the dumb guys. They're always the evil guys. They never portrayed them in a Didn't very good light. Be. Didn't used to be. Nope. Mm. No, nope, well, that, you know that's a profound that's a profound insight. So when when somebody goes to the movies, they want to be transported into a different world, and hopefully come out thinking of themselves and the people they love differently. But if they are going to the movie and they're being confronted with a worldview they know is false, they can vote with their dollars. Sure. Right. So they could just 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 stay away. But uh, yeah. t- 
let's talk about, uh, so we got, we've talked about young adults leaving Summit and, and your own kids and how they're, how they're telling their life stories. Um, right. Let's talk about that, that rewriting of the story a little bit more, because I just, I'd really like to close with this. It feels so important to me that we understand that we are part of something bigger. You know, like I, I just recently, uh, our people who've been watching our show know that I just did two episodes on a recent trip I had to Israel during a war zone. Wow. You know, Israeli society is fractured a hundred different ways. And yet they have a we, something that, that pulls them together in spite of a, an unbelievable number of differences, something Americans cannot relate to, you know, like 55 different political parties for 9 million people. Yeah. Uh, it's true. But they have a we. What is it? Because if we can tap into that, then the stories that we tell, our own stories, make sense in the bigger story. But what's that we that you guys are, are, are moving toward? That this, this would be a great vision for America if we, the people, ha had this or felt this way. Well, I mean, that, that is, I think, the crucial issue for the, for the United States today. is that We, we had it at 9-11 for a short time. Right. Yes. Is that we don't yeah. have that we. Uh, we. We don't recognize that anymore. We see each other as enemies instead of co-combatants. Right. That's Hollywood and the, and the mainstream media. And school. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, our schools have been teaching us this and dividing us. Um, you know, I will say that... Uh, it's basically the communist ideology that has infiltrated like a cancer in the body mm -hmm. of America and American politics. And so where the two parties used to be basically both pro-America, but we had slightly different opinions on how to get America moving ahead. Mm -hmm. Now, the Democrat Party is not pro-America anymore. They want basically to dissolve America no borders, no babies. That's their platform. It's so weird. And, and it was so odd to watch Joe Biden uh, and the State of the, Uni uh, State of the Union say, you, we want to protect your, it was something we want to protect you with the right to, to abort your child and protection for your children in school or something like that. It was like it was, this It was such a thing. dichotomy. It was a weird It was a contradiction. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's and the problem that I think we face as Christians is we have a very hard time recognizing evil. Hmm. We 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 don't want to look at it. We don't want to acknowledge it. We'd rather look away than understand that there are people out there who wish ill on this nation because mm -hmm. it is a Christian nation. Fifty six signers of the Declaration of Independence, all 56 were Christian uh, in varying degrees, but all the way to several of them wrote, translated their own Bibles. Okay. So, you know, we're talking Christian, not like, well, Easter and Christmas Christians by any stretch. And yet we've denied ourselves this story of our heritage. We've denied our children the tremendous history of the United States, the miracles that were involved in the Revolutionary War that everybody who participated in the Revolutionary War was like, oh my gosh, this is God's providence because we don't understand how this could possibly have happened. These coincidences all meshing together at the same time must be God's intervention. And we haven't told our children these stories. No, they don't teach civics in school because they don't want kids to know it's we the people. They and don't this want is, them to know that. And this is the, this is the thing that the, that the communists know. If you can prevent somebody from understanding, from understanding their own story, their history, then they are cut loose mm -hmm. and you can control their future. Well, the devil did a great job. He, 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 uh, he said, we don't, I don't exist. Yes, the <laughs> greatest right. trick that the devil made was yeah. convince yeah. someone he doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, that's where I remember that. I remember that line from the movie "The Usual Suspects." Um, yes, exactly. Power, powerful, right? The, the greatest trick the devil ever played was convincing people he didn't exist. But yeah. you, but you, obviously, you're the you're atheists, telling. Sorry, the you, greatest trick that the atheists have played is to convince us they don't believe in God. They do believe in God. They believe they are God, right? Yeah. yeah. And they're a jealous God, which is why you're not allowed to go to church. Yeah. Well, I think this is great. It's through stories that we can see yes. what binds us together, being stronger than what could tear us apart. 
and that Americans, even given all of these cultural influences, seem to be incredibly resilient. I think there's a lot of hope there. So, um, ma'am, best to you as you continue to tell these great stories and uh, find those chords that pull people together. I got to tell you, I get stopped all the time and through airports, hotel lobbies, and people say, it's not Hercules anymore. It's not my series Andromeda. It's We Love God's Not Dead, Soul Surfer, What If. Let there be like, please keep making movies like that. And that's what the people want out there, and Hollywood just doesn't want to give it to them. But we're going to keep fighting for that. We want people to go to SorboStudios.com. That's SorboStudios.com. Oh, by the way, we got going there. You can you can go find Miracle in East Texas, which is a true story. Yes, that is historical yeah. about the United States of America. That is uplifting and uh, empowering. It but was such a cute movie. I, the, you're, I you are right. We very rarely laugh aloud in movies these days, but we we did during that one. Thank you. It's a fun movie. <laughs> I've got two documentaries coming this year. You mentioned Israel. We go there uh, every year, but we can't go this year because no, of the war. The All the 80 people we had coming with us are too nervous and too afraid to go, which is unfortunate. But I was over there um, a little over a year ago. Sam came with me. We were there for almost uh, two and a half weeks. I did a documentary, and I was basically Indiana Jones. So we through the through the through the flow. We watched the flow of the Ark of the Covenant through archaeological digs. It's called the Quest for the Throne of God. It'll be out later this year. The other documentary I did with Brent Miller's company Ingenuity. Awesome, awesome group of guys. I did one with them a couple of years ago called Before the Wrath. I highly recommend this documentary. It deals with the second coming. I narrated it. Brent's company is just amazing. This is my second one with them. It deals with the Last Supper. It's unfortunate it's not going to be done in time for Easter, but it doesn't really matter because it's going to come out this year. And it's wow. called Eating with the Enemy. So please check mm -hmm. that out. Well, we're going to have some great watching that we get to do, thanks uh, to, to all the work that you guys are doing. Well, thank Sam and, and Kevin, thank you. Thanks, for, first of all, for entrusting your children to our summit team, and we've loved having them. And thank you for all the work you're doing to help Americans uh, and, and believers especially tell their story in a way that honors God and gives them hope for the future. Thank you. And I'm not a New England Patriot fan. I'm a Patriot for America. God bless America. <laughs> Thank you. Great to, great to visit with you guys. Thank you to my guests, Kevin and Sam Sorbo, for coming on the show today. If you want more resources that help you live out a biblical worldview as a student, a parent, an educator, or a church leader, head over to summit.org slash resources for articles, videos, ebooks, and more. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to today's episode. The Dr. Jeff Show podcast is a resource of Summit Ministries. Summit equips and supports the rising generation to embrace God's truth and champion a biblical worldview. If you want more resources that can help you live out a biblical worldview as a student or reach the next generation as an educator, church leader, or parent, head over to summit.org slash resources to find out about the programs, the articles, the videos, the eBooks, and more that we offer. Also, if you're looking for more great podcasts that will build your faith and inspire you, our friends at Edify have what you need. You can find more podcasts, including the Dr. Jeff Show podcast on the Edify app. Download it at edify.app, spell E-D-I-F-I. -I. And then you can also search for it in the Apple Store or the Google Play Store.